welcome everybody to the very first Archeo Gaming Con that I am aware of. Pretty sure it's the only one that's originated out of the United States so far. Um, we have an amazing four days of archaeology and gaming, aka Archeo Gaming, uh, content coming at you here on this Twitch channel which is, if you're watching this somewhere else for some reason, would be twitch.tv slash archeorpg, who is our in-kind sponsor. Um, they, are <clears throat> they are letting us take over their Twitch channel for the weekend. So if you are here bright and early at this 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time hour, then good for you. Maybe maybe it's Thursday and this is just what your Thursday looks like, but I tell you what, man, coffee was the only thing that got me out of bed. So we are here to talk about the different ways that Archeo Gaming impacts society, gaming, archaeology. We have a variety of people coming to talk about not just like tabletop games and video games though we do have a lot of video games but we do have some role-playing game involved we have how to make a game we have <laughs> we have panels <laughs> about gaming um we also have some really frank discussions about racism in gaming and representation in gaming so i'm literally looking forward to those we're gonna dig into some really popular games like assassin's creed and elder scrolls online and uncharted and i think we're gonna do god of war somebody's doing god of war there's a lot of assassin's creed just fyi if you like assassin's creed i've got you my specialty of course is elder scrolls online with my tamriel archaeological guild which is an actual guild in the tamriel game we are doing actual archaeology, and I'll get to my presentation in a moment. Before we go any farther, though, I do want to say this is crazy. Um, I realized I wasn't going to be able to go to Gen Con this year for obvious reasons. And so I was like, hey, what if we had an Archeo gaming convention the same weekend? And no one stopped me. So this is everyone else's fault. Uh, this has gone together much smoother than I anticipated it going, considering we as a whole put this con together in three weeks. It took us, I think, three days, three 72-ish day, uh, 72 days, 72-ish hours to get everything organized, to get the Discord going, and to start getting it populated with people who were interested in participating either by giving a panel or just kind of watching to see if we were going to turn into a dumpster fire, which thank God we did not. Um, so yeah, 72 hours after I put out my random tweet about, hey, let's do an Archeo Gaming Con, um, we were doing it. And we have, over the span of the planning period, we've had over 30 presentations proposed, I think the majority of them have made it to the final cut, which is just amazing to me. Um, no fault on anybody. If you proposed something and it didn't make it, the fact that you even proposed something, you're like, hey, look at this thing. It's only going to take three weeks. Oh, wait. Yeah, sure. I'll throw my hat into the crazy. Why not? Thank you all for doing that. Uh, thank you, everyone who's getting ready to watch this. Even if you don't watch mine, thank you for sticking around and watching somebody else's. If you're just here for one or two presentations, it's fine with me too. Thanks for coming. That's great. Um, I do want to say that this would not have been possible if there had not been so much interest in it. Um, and like I was saying earlier, I'm very happy with the very few mistakes or issues that have arisen and i know this is going to sound weird but maybe some of you who are perfectionists will understand ah these damn straps um all of the problems that have occurred are kind of a me thing like me not being prepared or me not thinking things through 
Um, so any of the problems that are actually popping up, I'm really happy to say have all been a me problem. And I mean, I can count no major issues. We've had a lot of really good questions. We've had a lot of great people asking about hammering things out and making things more clear for the next time we do this. Because maybe we're doing this again next year with more planning, not not just three weeks. Um, everyone who has offered to help and who has offered to participate has done a phenomenal job. Um, nobody has let me down. Nobody has disappointed me. Every step of the way just makes me more and more excited about everything that we're getting ready to do these next four days. And... I'm just really humbled and really appreciative of everybody's support and everybody's willingness to just kind of drop life for four days and do nothing but talk about archaeology and gaming. Two of the world's funnest things, digging in the dirt and pretending to be imaginary people. They kind of go hand in hand. So. Uh, I do want to give, I'm not going to give a shout out to everybody who is involved because there are at current count close to 80 individuals who are involved in this in some capacity. Most of them are the, pres the presenters, which means they're doing all the hard work. All I had to do was everything else, which I don't know. I just, I feel like the process of creating is more stressful, whereas the process of organizing and, and making things fit I don't know. I maybe I don't know. I feel like I was just here and everybody else did stuff. But that being said, uh, this honest to God would not have been possible without Bill Ochter, a.k.a. Archeo Thoughts on Twitter and also the brainchild behind Archeo RPG and him donating the channel and his time to creating a lot of the um, I want to say propaganda because I think it's a funny word, but you know what I mean? The advertising and the stuff that have gone out. Uh, again, we're using the Twitch channel for RKO RPG. Super excited about that. Um, I would have done this on my own channel, which is RK Fantasies, if you didn't know. But it just brand-wise fits RKO RPG for obvious reasons. Uh, and the other person who I could not have done this without is Christina Krupa, Dr. Christina Krupa, who is, God, I hope I said your name right, is like the organization queen and just like I, okay, look, I'm good at Google Docs. I like to think I'm good at Google Docs. I am wrong. Dr. Krupa kicked ass, took names, locked everything down so people couldn't change things anymore like she nipped problems in the bud before they ever even occurred super happy about that so for both of you thank you very much i could not have done this as smoothly as it has gone without both of you helping me and that being said thank you to all of my presenters who you're getting ready to see in the next four days obviously couldn't have done it without you guys because we wouldn't have a con so thank all of you and you're all going to get your 15 minutes of fame coming up. I have tried to create beautiful artwork in Canva for everybody to make you all individuals, to give you each your own personality during this con. Um, and also, I want to give a shout out to um, Goth Sickles, who is a, a band. <laughs> I know this sounds incredibly crazy. Uh, they just got with us, like, Thursday? No, they were starting Thursday. Wednesday. They got with us Wednesday and offered us the fabulous Konami Code song that you will be hearing a lot of because it just fits perfectly in with our con, of course. So thank you, Gothsicles, for that. Please go check out their channels. Um, it's it's Gothsicles. If you type it in, it kind of pops up everywhere. And um, one last thing I want to say before I go into actually why you're here and it's not just to listen to me ramble for what am I at? I haven't. I've just gone over 10 minutes. Bye. Uh, we do have an official charity. It is Archaeology in the Community. It is run by the amazing 
Dr. Jones, um, also Dr. Jones, seriously, no one, really, no one. Anyway, uh, Dr. Jones has put together and has been running archaeology in the community, I think for 10 years, I saw on the website. Um, what she does is she puts together accessible archaeological educational programs and classes for kids and adults, uh, but mostly kids, and offers them for free a lot of times to the community. She is based mostly out of the D.C. area, but I have it under good authority that they are expanding to a national organization, or at least they were going to, which is another reason why I really felt like uh, using them as our charity this year was vastly important because because of the thing that shall not be named, because I don't know how that affects videos, but the big C right now, C19, not C14. Anyway, um, of course, everybody's been impacted negatively. I don't think anybody hasn't been impacted negatively by it. And so this is our way of being archaeologists, giving back to archaeologists who are doing really good work in their communities with the next generation, with the current generation even. And so that being said, if you would like to donate to a worthy cause, a worthy archeological cause hell bent on teaching archeology span to children and bringing diversity into the archeological field, then please go over to the archeological, archeological, archaeology in the community donation page and there they have a series of donations you can just randomly click on because those are the amounts that they would like to receive and i would like you to give them and if you do i will give you a thing just for donating money to archaeology in the community and also if you don't want to give one of the um preset amounts they do have the ability to give whatever you want to give and any donation over five dollars will receive a official vinyl sticker i think they're vinyl that's what the website said they were the website said they were vinyl don't yell at me uh, but an official sticker for the con proof that you attended and you were part of year zero of the archaeo gaming con all you have to do is go and do the donation obviously and then um, they'll send you an email. You can just send me a copy of that email uh, along with your mailing address. That's all the personal information I need from you is your name and the proof that you donated and your mailing address. That's all, that's all I want from you. <laughs> and then I will make sure that the Redbubble website sends you your stuff and you can be an archeological hero too. Now. Enough rambling. I hope I've gotten all the information I need to get out to you. The schedule for the next four days will be popping up on this channel periodically. If you need more information about the schedule, gosh, join these straps. The next four days, please head over to the Archie Fantasies Twitter or the Archie RPG Twitter. We will be tweeting out who's coming up, what's being presented, and the upcoming schedules. Um, trying to think if there's going to be anywhere else that these are going to be. I'm not putting it on my blog. There's a reason for that, but I might throw them up on the Archeo RPG blog just in case. But at this point, we're already starting the con, so stick around, pay attention, and, you know, these are fully interactive. You'll be able to chat on Twitter, Twitch. Well, you can chat on Twitter, too, I suppose. Be sure to use the hashtag if you are. And, yeah, let's, let's get going on this con, people. Woo! Who's up for some Elder Scrolls? All right. I promised you. Promised you a video about, uh, yep, the Tamriel Archaeological Guild. Welcome. Welcome. Figured we can play a little while we do that. So. What am I doing? Woo! All right. First off. This is my beautiful boy. My lovely little boy. He is modeled after my own cat. 
and Trumpy. I, sorry, I'm just amused beyond words with this little pocket mammoth. But anyway, maybe gorgeous. Gorgeous in like that cute kind of motherly way, like you want to pinch his cheeks and be like, he's the cute you boy. And then throw him a cat treat and watch him go nuts. Anyway, we are in Northern Elsewhere. And the reason that is important... Sorry, I have an alarm. The reason that is important is because... The Tamriel Archaeological Guild. Again, a real guild in Tamriel. A hey, flax. Was kind of, sort of, founded here. And it was founded before... Look, I've already proven I can't fight things and talk at the same time, so let's let's just not... Uh, but it was founded for the main purpose of um, a bunch of archaeologists got together and were like, hey, let's play Elder Scrolls. So we did. And when we did that, we were like, hey, you could do almost, almost do real archaeology here. And then I was like, hey, I need a master's project uh, to graduate. And then the Black Plague hit. I know that's not fair, but it's true. And, uh, yeah, so then nobody could do anything because we have to be quarantined for everything. And probably, honestly, should still be being quarantined, but not the time, not the place. And, um, yeah, so I actually, in under two weeks, if you're noticing a uh, pattern to my behavior, uh, you and my shrink should probably talk. Anyway, uh, in under two weeks, I managed to put together a research proposal that I submitted to my professor, who was helping me with my thesis, uh, about doing a phase one archaeological survey within the game Elder Scrolls. And she was like, I don't know what you're talking about, tell me more. And so I have told her more. And she agrees that this is a great idea. Using a virtual world and using real-world archaeological techniques inside a virtual world. Um, I know that that's like the very basic um, definition of what archaeogaming is. Archaeogaming is a lot. And... You're going to see me avoiding a lot of things, especially that thing. Um, but, oh, shit, you saw me. Run, run, you fools. Ah, flee. Oh, good, he didn't follow me. Uh, anyway, Archeo game means a lot of things, and it means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Like many fields in archaeology, it is still developing and still being sussed out. But the re what, what it really is is the acknowledging that digital spaces are human-built... They're, they're human-built worlds. Uh, they're human-built objects. And... All an artifact has to be, an artifact, is man-made. So, you know, that camel is an artifact. This cactus is an artifact. That, well, I don't know what this is. Tree. <laughs> this is an artifact. So is this rock. Ah, darn it, you found me. I can't talk and do this. One of us will screw up and babble. Die! I was busy lecturing! This Doom Ripper's hide, strange beach shield, and carapace that it had on it. Those are all artifacts, and they're now in my inventory. But my point being is that because everything in this game is man-made, this entire game is an artifact. But this entire game is also a site. 
which is why we can use archaeological methods to study it. Um, and many of our presenters throughout the rest of the con are going to get into some real in-depth analysis of everything I just rambled about. Um, so I highly recommend you stick around for that because those are also people who are much better at explaining this than I am. But let me explain to you what I did. Because I can explain that. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I am a CRM archaeologist. And what that means is I do cultural resource management, a.k.a. contract archaeology. I am part of the moving, the many moving parts of Section 106, which is a law that is on the books specifically to help preserve uh, our history in all its forms. Um, yes. So what I do, hey, look, it's a dead thing. Uh, what I do is I go out into the real world, not the digital world. We need better words for this. And I do survey, and I do a type of archaeology called survey. We do f several different phases. There's three of them currently, and within those three, there's a breakdown of those three. And the important one that you need to know is phase 1A, which is pedestrian survey. In pedestrian, if you don't know what pedestrian means, it means walking, basically. Uh, there's a counterpart to that, which is also shovel testing, which is what it sounds like. We take a shovel and we dig some holes. And we see what's in the hole. Hey, look, other players. Hi, other players. How are you? Oh, you're coming up here. Hi, other players. You just keep your bad attitude over there. That's right. Have fun with those. Anyway, um, since we can't physically dig, or at least at the time, we were unable to physically dig in the game, this game, this very game, uh, we decided to use a Phase 1A survey method where we took the map and, yes, my beautiful map. We took this map and we found out that there are coordinates on this map. And then there's this guy that's just like, I don't know what happened to this dude. It's not perfect. Um, we found some add-ons that helped us see the coordinates. So now I can not only see where my cursor is on this map, I know what my location is as well. We also found another add-on that allows us to put custom pins, which is what you're looking at here. Pretty much any pin that is colored is a custom pin. And then for some unknown reason, I thought it was a good idea to use um, white houses as a pin. That, that was a me thing. But as you can see, we did a lot. Every one of these pins was physically dropped, which means my character and uh, my other two surveyors characters, because there were three of us, and I thank you all who partook on this crazy adventure. Um, every one of these flags, my character was physically present to drop. And what we did is we dropped a pin, and it automatically took down the um, longitude and latitude of the map for us, which is always 100 to 100. There's always... 100 one way, 100 the other way. Uh, what we don't know is what those are supposed to represent, so we chose to use the word meter because we're archaeologists and we work in the metric most of the time. So as you can see, we not only uh, left a pin, dropped a pin, and the coordinates, uh, a lot of these we left a... I'm checking my game. See, I'm on the game right now. Thank you, Alexa. Check your game. Uh, but we also left a little note. That and our initials, SMH, those are my initials. That's so we could come back to this at a future point 
and not have to physically go back to the location, but we would know what was there, why it was important. Uh, we have various different icons that mean different things. Some of them are kind of self-explanatory. Some of them not so much. Uh, this feather means NPC. We, we didn't have a good NPC icon, so there it is. Um, yeah. I really liked all of these add-ons. They were great. Uh, this is part of the game. Uh, you will notice that there are... There we go. Other people's initials, those are the other people who worked on the survey with me. Um, Dr. Krupa, Christina Krupa, who I have mentioned earlier, was pretty much the person that did all of the transects. So any of these straightish lines that you're seeing, these are, these are what we call transects. And they are evenly spaced throughout the map. They run from one side of the board to the other. And they map the space that your character can go into. And then within those transects, we mapped everything that fell within a certain range of items. Now, I ran the perimeter of the maps. Now, you will notice that the map is huge. But these little red flags, these little crimson-y raspberry flags, um, they mark the actual border. They mark the part of the map where you can no longer go any further. Most of the time on the maps, these are marked with um, mountains. Like when you're playing the physical game, there is a physical barrier there that keeps you from being able to go any further uh, on the map when you're in the game. And you can see them on the map, but there are also spaces that show up on the actual map that you can't get to from the base game, from the, the base map. There's a way to get there, but I think you have to go through... Yeah, you have to go through the Adept... This is the actual Adeptorium, and this is the entrance to said Adeptorium. So, it's interesting to me how much space is depicted on the maps that isn't actually used, and I can figure out where on the map those would be because I can kind of point at it with a cursor and compare it to you know, the actual map point of my flags that I've dropped. Uh, eventually, I want to take all of these points, and they can be removed from the... I mean, I can access this data um, on the back end of the game, so I can go in and um, basically pull this data out, put it into a raster... Roster? Yeah, raster format, and then I can um, take that raster information and put it into, I'm hoping to put it into ArcGIS and create an interactive map that way uh, that will have layers. So when you zoom in, it'll zoom in like this, but then when it gets to this point, it'll zoom in further and we can see more and play around with the map more. Uh, we'll be able to make more accurate measurements from one point to the next and, you know, do all kinds of fun stuff with it. Uh, that is that is a hope to get to, not a make or break. But what I still need before anything else is I need to know what's where, what's it doing, who's there. Um, Dr. Krupa also did a... Um, skeletal analysis for me of all of the humanoid, there we go, humanoid skeletons in the game, and the reason why I'm specifying that they were humanoid is because, as you see, we did multiple maps, we did multiple zones, so this is Grotwood, which is a uh, wood elf dominated zone, and then of course northern elsewhere, which is the Khajiit, Ka yeah, the Khajiit, and then we did Mirkwood. Where's Mirkwood? Mirkwood's in other, isn't it? Yes, Mirkmire, sorry. So as you can see, we also did Mirkmire, and so that's why I'm saying humanoid, because 
the um sometimes the skeletons look weird because <laughs> they don't look like human uh but they all have the same like two arms two legs one head sometimes you have a tail sometimes you don't you don't find any like truly odd like an insectoid one you don't see one of those or you know encephalopod they they don't have skeletons but my point is anyway so I, as you can see dr krupa did like i said the lion's share of this i don't want to be on this map anymore here we go of the um transact she did a great job I'm glad she did it because she was able to spot some things that I would not necessarily have spot. Like, see, we've got the dead Argonian here. We also marked little reed structures, entrances to caves. I'm probably waxing poetic about this, and you don't care. Um, has uh, text allied to the dread father? Yeah. Each one of these was really interesting because each one of these is like. A different culture. Uh, I really enjoy the way the game tries to do that. Props. It's not without its issues, but it is it is cool. Overall map of Tamriel, the cursor does work here. Again, all of these maps are 100 or 100, 100, and I know that because I can measure it easily. I think they're actually 99 by 99, but still my point being. Every time I change my map, it shows me different coordinates for my for me, because this is the coordinates of me. This is where I am on this map. And then if I go to Northern Elsewhere, you'll notice that my coordinates change because my location is different. So I just kind of zoom out, does a top-in, top-out kind of thing. Huzzah, huzzah. Anyway. Um... One of the other things I wanted to talk about was, you'll see all these yellow flags here. After we did the initial phase one survey here, we then went back and on each zone we picked a, a set of structures that looked interesting. And we did a full survey of those structures where we went in and we mapped everything. Um, so... I did this one, which is why I'm using this one, because I know what all my little flags mean. I've got Crips, I've got um, Than or, uh, Thanar the Grave Prowler, if that tells you where this is. But because of that, I was also able to determine that this whole grouping of ruins is probably the same structure, or was the same structure at some point, and now is not. It's now in ruins. Um, each cluster of these yellow flags is a point of the actual physical structures. And again, when I go in and pull all this data out, I mean, right now it just looks like a bunch of flags, uh, but when I go and pull all this data out, there will be actual coordinates attached to it, and I will be able to use those coordinates to remap the site completely. So I'll be able to create a map of this site outside of the game that we can then interact with. Um, and... Oh, and that's the reason I wanted to show you that one, is because I have not uploaded the ones from Grotwood and Merkmeyer. No, I have not. I know Bill went up here and I believe he surveyed this area up here. I don't remember where we surveyed in Grotwood. Shame on me. Alright, so. Um, that's exciting, I know. Maps are amazing. Maps are great. Maps are wonderful. But what's the point? Alright, so when we decided to do this, the, uh, the antiquity system had not dropped yet. And we specifically did our phase one survey pre Graymore. And we did that on purpose, actually, because another aspect of CRM archaeology is we go in and survey an area before it's developed a lot of times. So 
you know, someone's going to put in a road or they're going to put in a, um, a, a cell tower or anything. Anything that gets built and it's disturbing the ground or has the potential to disturb the ground, you'll see a crew of archaeologists go in before the building equipment goes in. And that's because we have to go in and make sure that there's nothing of historical significance that's going to get destroyed or disrupted and, you know, how significant it is. And there's a whole bunch of other things that go into all of that. What is that? A jackal? Why are you sparkly? Weirdo. Oh, it's a crow. Bye, crow. Anyway, um... So that kind of corresponded with our surveys of the area because everything that was surveyed was surveyed before uh, the new download. And the reason for that was is we weren't sure how things were going to change with the new antiquity system getting put in. We weren't sure what was going to be impacted, um, if the map themselves were going to change, if structures were going to get moved around or added. It's not uncommon for that to happen. So we weren't 100% positive what was going to occur. So what we did is we ran through, we did the survey uh, in two weeks. We managed to get all three of those zones surveyed in two weeks and we were able to get the um, faunal analysis, not faunal, the um, bone analysis done in that two weeks as well. And it was pretty cool actually. And, and much like every other survey on the planet. Uh, we now have all this data and we're going through it and we're putting a report together. And by we, we mean, I mean me. So right now I have a crap ton of <laughs> stuff to put into. I'm using Google Forms because another part of this is, is I want to make sure that all of this stays accessible to everybody, everybody. So once I get everything all written and put together, I will be making all of my research uh, publicly accessible. I think I'm going to wait until after I get everything done, though. That just seems like a smart idea. And But I'm going to put a halt on the game right here. And I want to show you guys what the data looks like when it's outside of the game world. Okay, so I think I've hidden majority of stuff that's going to be an issue. <laughs> if not, oh well. Um, so this is actually the Tamriel Archaeological Survey folder where I have been storing all of the good stuff. You can see my thesis proposals right here. We had a outline of what the, the custom pins were going to look like. And we did have a... I'm recording. Sorry. And we did have a phase one procedural proposal put together um, just so everybody knew what we were supposed to be doing when we did the survey. Um, so after that, one of the things we did in the survey was we made sure that everybody took videos. Everything got videoed. Everything got videoed. So we did do Southern Elsewhere, but we decided not to go forward with Southern Elsewhere. That's right. So let's not linger here. Ah, Google, read my mind. Um, so like here in the Merkmire, uh, I did the border of the Merkmire. So these are the MP4s of me running around and surveying the frickin' Merkmire. And as you can see, they are about as interesting as you think they are going to be. Apparently, here we go. Uh, I also thought that it was going to be a genius idea to use a different character in each zone. So instead of using my Khajiit here, I'm actually using my Argonian. Um, turned out to be a little bit more difficult than I thought it was going to be because she's not very high level and... I'm going to turn the sound off on this. She wasn't very big, so we had a lot of we had a hard time getting into certain areas with her, weaving me. But as you can see, I'm running around the border here. Every time she stops, it's because I'm doing something. Yeah, here we go. So here's the custom pin. 
This is me inputting the data of the custom pin. I know what my coordinates are because they're right here. I was putting in a boundary marker, so I didn't really need to put in a, like a big description of anything. But there you go, see? And then I swam out. Is this the one where I keep getting killed by slaughterfish? Probably. I mean, when I say I tested the border, I mean I tested the border. I, I swam out on more than one occasion. Was Yep, yeah, there I go. Got murdered by slaughterfish. But I know where the border was. So, there you go. So after we took all of this... All these videos, and I wasn't the only one taking videos. Uh, Bill obviously took some, and Kristen took some too. And these are the accidental discoveries. She went in and uh, videotaped all of that. The reason the video was so important was because it was our document. It was our main documentation for. Um, what we did and so what I was able to do after that was I went in and took each one of the films so I have sat through and watched all of those most of those and what I did with that was I've created a data log So these are all of the different video formats, videos that were taken, where they were taken, who took them. And I also have a photo log master list. I can take screenshots out of these videos now and, and also the screenshots that people took while they were surveying. So I've got video and screenshots, but then I can take screenshots out of the videos as well. And that actually creates more videos. Uh, it also allows me, yeah, see, we're up to 300 videos coming out of this. Some of these are just, you can kind of see the little videos, or not the videos, the pictures. It's nice because... Like with um, Christina's stuff. Christina ran all of these transects. And she took a lot of screenshots, which is great. But then when I sat and watched the transects, I was like, oh, I wish I had a picture of, you know, I don't know, that these ruins from that angle. Because we video recorded everything, it gave me the ability to go back into those videos and take extra screenshots out. Because I don't need, I need the whole video because it's documentation. But when I'm presenting, I don't really need the whole video. I just need a screenshot. So basically the videos allowed me to create a larger, um, a larger screenshot or, yeah, a, large, a larger photo log than I would have been able to do anyway because I couldn't be there with Christina when she did every one of these transects. So if I want a specific screenshot, I have to rely on the videotape of her doing the transect, which is fabulous. Fabulous, because I can. Now, every one of these photos are then being treated as if they are the artifact bag because we obviously can't pick up physical artifacts um, for obvious reasons, they don't actually exist, these things, so they don't tangibly exist. So my artifact catalogs, and I also have site logs, uh, but my artifact catalog is heavily dependent on the photos. Uh, so with my artifact catalog here, you know, I've got my project number. If there's a site, there'll be a site number location, launch lat, artifact number, everything gets a number. I'll be filling certain categories out more as we go. But here you go, description of the artifact that I'm looking at. It's a bedroll. It was unrolled bedroll with a white pillow, green bat, uh, white straw beneath. That is a very common thing. 
Now, this gives me photo number five. So I should be able to follow this to data cell number five. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Eventually it will load. So I've got photo number five. It's actually data cell number six, but that's a whole other thing. Now I can click on this. It'll take me to the picture that we are pulling this artifact from. Close that because I don't need those. And there you go. You can see what I'm talking about here with the. This is the bedroll that we're talking about. It's a bedroll, unrolled, green mat, white pillow, whitish hay underneath. So effectively, this picture is the artifact bag. And everything that's in this picture that I felt was significant for our survey was recorded as an artifact. And here's where it gets tricky with... Archeo gaming because since we're looking at the game as if it is a artifact and a site, um, every one of these, like this photo, is a photo of a site. Like this, this is a site. Everything on here can be treated as if it were part of a site because it is. And everything in this picture is an individual artifact. But this picture itself is also an artifact. This individual picture right here, this file, is an artifact. This file is part of a larger file. So this artifact is part of another larger bag of artifacts, which would be the video that Christina took of the transect that she did, because this is Christina's character. So that video file is also a site, and it is also an artifact. And that video is, you know, you see how this keeps going, or like Matryoshka dolls, Matryoshka? Matryoshka dolls. Um, now, now, what am I doing with all of this? What, what's going to happen? with all of this data. Um, as a phase one survey, you know, I'm treating this as if it were a physical location in the real world. So the phase one survey is meant to be a sampling of an area. Uh, you are not recording every single thing. We did not record every little thing on this map. Uh, we could it would take a significant amount of time, but it could be done. We didn't do that. The sample that we took is roughly 10%. I think it's a little, I think it's actually more like 20%. We ended up taking 20% sample of the site. Are these bad guys? Oh, I should totally run up to them. Eee, the dragon. No, wait, that's a rock. Never mind. Um... So by taking that sample, we can use it to kind of make some guesses about the overall area. The overall Northern Elsewhere zone, just based on the little sampling that we took. So we know how many, we can guess how many sites we came across, how many campsites we came across, how many campfires, um, modern structures, ancient structures. Again, we kept track of any kind of remains we ran into. We also kept track of isolated finds, which would be random individual artifacts that are just kind of, hi bud, off in the ether. Like, I think one of the things I showed you was a barrel. There was just a barrel hanging out in one of the transects. We recorded that. We didn't record things like the flora and the fauna. Uh, we did record hostels, but that was a lot more because when people go back, they might want to be prepared for the fact that they're going to get attacked by crap while they're trying to do survey. It happens. I died a lot doing this. So why is it important? That's the question we always keep coming back to. Um, why, why is Archeo Gaming specifically important? 
I go back to the everything you see here is constructed. But everything you see here is constructed with a purpose. You know, this broken down wagon isn't random. The game itself did not go, oh, hey, I'm just going to randomly slap a, uh, a broken down wagon here. This was a decision that was made by the game developers. There's a story being told here. There's a, there's a story behind this wagon. There's a story behind this, this road that I'm walking on and these half walls that are here. There's a story behind these guide lights. I mean, yes, they're in the game to help me, the player, keep on the safe path in between towns. But there are also these guiding paths that are in between the major towns on this map. So what does it mean that all of these towns banded together at some point to create safe roadways and then marked them for people? You know, what's the story behind this beautiful structure? I think we're in Rimen now. You know? What's the story behind these sugarcane patties? Because again, these are not randomly generated. These were put here by the game developers for a reason. Whether it's just like, hey, we need to have some rice patties or some um, sugarcane patties. Yeah, but why? What's the importance of the sugarcane? What's the sugarcane telling us? Well, if this is the main crop of the Khajiit. So this is kind of a way of demonstrating that this area is Khajiit. So RQ Gaming is important because it's not just a study of man-made objects and how we communicate culture in a game setting because how we're communicating the culture in this game setting is how we perceive that culture should be presented in the real world and that's what archaeo gaming is kind of about archaeo gaming is a way of examining 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 the real world by looking at how we construct our fantasy worlds. There's a lot of deep lore that goes into the Elder Scrolls games, and, you know, the fandom for this game is A+. Um, I've really enjoyed the, the fan-made stuff that I've run into about the lore in this game. And it's highly detailed. The game itself is highly detailed with its own back lore. And everything about that back lore tells us about how people interact with culture in... Or how they expect to interact with culture in the real world. You know? So by studying Archeo Gaming and by studying man-made worlds within a game... We are studying humans, human beings' interaction with the cultures of the real world. If you play this game, you'll see a lot of overlap of things, a lot of ways of people saying in-game with visual cues, this culture is this, this culture is that. And because I have all these visual clues telling me that the Khajiit are supposed to be mimicking a certain real-world culture, I fill in the blanks for everything else. It's that kind of communication. It's, it's visual communication of culture through game. But it's also a constructed culture. The Khajiit are not X culture in the real world. They're inspired by, but they're not meant to physically be a one-to-one -one representation of them. And I think the only one you can really say that about is like the Imperials and the Greco-Romans. They, they really are kind of a one-for-one -one there. And the Norse and the Nords, those are definitely a one-to-one. -one. But so, overall, uh, now that I've rambled for about 45 minutes, uh, yeah, so my, my master's thesis is on this. Um, and as you can see, I've got quite a bit of data that I am compiling. I can't wait to get it all done so I can actually start seeing what the data is telling me. And uh, the reason that I'm doing this is because it's, it's actually kind of important. Um, it's important to see how we construct worlds that we are going to interact with to tell narratives about imaginary peoples because that also 
tells us how we expect the real world to work. And it doesn't always work that way. But, you know, that's the fun of a game. <gasps> yes, Trumpy. Yes. Look, I named him Trumpy because he's got a trumpet. I don't have a better name for him. I guess I could name him Masty. <gasps> Masty. Masty Dog. Anyway, uh, so yeah, thank you all for joining me on my great and... I just really like this view, I'm sorry. Uh, this great and rambling escapade through the world of Tamriel. Um, my Phase 1A survey is not the only research project, real-world research project, that Tamriel Archaeological Guild is going to participate in. It just happens to be the first... Uh, we do have plans to take the Phase 1 into a full Phase 3 in the future, uh, but it all kind of depends on me getting the Phase 1 done, so do 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 And yeah, we've got other things that we're studying here. We've got cultural studies and um, just game representation studies. We will get into that more. We being Dr. Krupa is doing a fabulous analysis of the antiquities circle which is part of the new and uh, the new data data the new part of the game that dropped the gray more part so i'm not going to say anything about that or show you any of my antiquity artifacts or even my scrying eye thing uh and i will save my opinions if you've watched any of my live streams before you probably know my opinion of them but yes i'm going to let dr krupa take that away and show us her amazing character that runs around in Elder Scrolls all the time, because her character is like 600 level or whatever. Something crazy like that. But anyway, boom, nice shot of the sky. Thank you all for joining me. Stick around for the rest of the con, and I hope you all are having a good time. Anyway, I suck at endings. Goodbye!